case we have uh, used uh, these uh, simulation, this role play game that was uh, uh, that was uh, created by the MIT group working on climate change. Uh, just like uh, it's the same group uh, that uh, has uh, created and engineered the, the uh, simulation tools that we get familiar to in the last <coughs> There are two versions of this game. There is a version that is more oriented toward uh, global, uh, global change, meaning that uh, uh, you don't have to get, take care about national interests. And this first uh, uh, role-playing game that uh, was uh, uh, created by the MIT group uh, uses uh, uh, M-Roads, the first simulation tools that we have uh, uh, used here in class. For this other simulation game that uh, is about the negotiation at uh, a possible COP28 or another Paris meeting, uh, the world uh, is divided into six regions that are exactly the six regions that you, that each group uh, of our class has represented since the beginning of this class. Uh, so, uh, I really want to thank you, uh, all the creators, for these. I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't have the time or no opportunity to register this event, uh, but uh, I was in touch with some of the guys behind the these groups uh, and uh, I promised uh, to uh, share with them the recordings of uh, these two sessions. Now, so let's start with a briefing uh, before we start from role-playing. Uh, we will uh, follow this agenda. I will start with, with a very short introduction about uh, the summit uh, right now and I will welcome officially as the Secretary for, of the United Nations to the delegates of the groups. Then we're gonna have the first round that is, as you know, centered about around the proposals, the national determined contributions that you have refined more and more during these six weeks. After that, we will run a first simulation about uh, you, uh, that uh, tries, that will try to uh, foresee what kind of possible effects your national determined contribution is gonna have. On climate change. After this, we will start with the first round of negotiations, and that will be this phase. We will try to get back to some or even more refined proposals. Probably we will take uh, uh, more than just a simple couple of rounds about this because uh, I cannot make any spoiler about it, but you should expect a little bit, a little bit of surprises. Finally, in order to set uh, things uh, uh, for good, uh, we will pass to a debrief phase. But by now, it's time to introduce you to, uh, the, uh, to this uh, game. This game uh, comes in two versions, uh, three regions, uh, negotiation party, and uh, a sixth region. <coughs> we are playing this one, and as I was uh, briefing uh, my uh, two collective groups, the other developed nations here represented by Australia and the other developing nations here represented by Brazil. Even if uh, you have to keep in mind uh, your national interests, it's uh, important that you remember that now sitting at the, this conference hosted by the United Nations, you are also representing the other countries that are usually included in these uh, political and geopolitical blocks. So this is, this is quite important because uh, you share with uh, Australia and Brazil, share with uh, uh, these other nations, uh, not just the gross domestic product and uh, sometimes also the means of production, the economic system, but as you can imagine, also some environmental issues that are very urgent are shared by the same, by the same uh, sometimes when you are more than 30, you want to add to this uh, uh, game also other groups that are not representative of uh, a specific nation or a specific block. You got the Climate Justice Oaks, the United States Climate Alliance, Fossil Fuel Lobbies, and Journalists. Again, I will make any spoiler, but uh, you should expect that maybe something could happen in this respect. 
So what uh, I asked you to do yesterday and what I asked you to uh, focus on also today. I told you, I asked you to formulate a strategy starting from your nation's agenda. Meaning that uh, you should have a find and you have done so, I know this. You have a vital interest for your, uh, for your country the, uh, the, to assess the political feasibility of uh, reforms and changes in your country or in your bloc, to understand and to imagine, to, to formulate a request to other countries. And uh, I want to underline that this kind of request can take the form or of uh, either economical aid or uh, an economical request. It depends a lot on what, what is the state, the economic status of the country, and at the same time to, to make up your minds about what you can offer to other blocks or other countries. Uh, you have already made these, even if I will leave five minutes to make a final point about it, uh, to talk to your team, to your team, to, to, within your team, in order to formulate a final national contribution. One that you will share right now after my uh, welcome presentation, and then you will have to negotiate also with other groups in order to try to have an agreement about this. Uh, uh, you have uh, been uh, an amazing class, a lovely class. Uh, I mean it, uh, and uh, I also have. Uh, had the opportunity to appreciate uh, your sensitivity and uh, your respect in terms of diversity and inclusion. Uh, so I know that it's quite redundant to ask you not to fake accent for a specific region, not, not and, uh, but have you have done so, not even pretending you with some costumes that would belong to the groups you, uh, to the group uh, you represent with your nation. And uh, this is, these are the rules. If you have questions about uh, uh, what uh, we are about to do today and on Thursday, this is the last time I will, I will answer your questions as a, a professor of your class. Because, uh, as I say, in a while I'm going to turn to my next political talk with my life. Is everything clear? Let's start. Delegates, it is uh, with great honor that I welcome you to the Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. As you know, I am the Secretary General of the United Nations, for, or, uh, and uh, this uh, is uh, the role of meeting in order to go beyond the, the well done agreement, but maybe unsatisfactory since uh, the last day that we have gathered and published just yesterday go beyond the Paris Agreement uh, and uh, try to find a solution about what is going on in our planet. I want to start by congratulating you uh, for ensuring that uh, we have uh, arranged an agreement, the Paris One, which has guided until now towards achieving a global goal, our global goal, of keeping the global temperature increase at 12 below 2 degrees Celsius. But what is the situation so far? What kind of situation we are facing right now? I will uh, take a uh, uh, few time of your important uh, uh, work here in order to review the science uh, behind climate change uh, in uh, the, uh, one of the most uh, important issues, the most relevant issues that are defining uh, the current scenario for climate change. So as you know, atmospheric CO2 is uh, higher than any time in the last 800,000 years, and uh, these levels of carbon dioxide are increasing faster than any time in a million years. Here we have the baseline for the things, and uh, here in a more than super linear, more than exponential increase, have the current level, the last time we had a shared measurement of this, 2019. The global temperature change just follows exactly the same pattern. 
you can see that the global temperature change from the pre-industrial era in Celsius degree has uh, just uh, reached uh, some levels that leave no doubt uh, to possible uh, contestation of uh, uh, possible objection to what the scientists have said until now. We have already reached uh, an increase in temperature growth of more than 1.8 degrees Celsius. And uh, we are afraid, we are scared that uh, if we don't do anything about this, we can actually re-achieve uh, an increase in temperature growth of 3.6 degrees Celsius minimum. And uh, it is uh, undeniable that this situation has to do with uh, the sources of energy that we have employed so far. Uh, coal, oil, gas uh, still uh, represent the vast majority of the energy sources that we are employing and the CO2 emissions uh, for these sources, as uh, you can see from uh, this chart, uh, leaves again no space for doubt. Our way of sustaining our industry, our economies, uh, is just unsustainable in terms of, uh, in term of uh, uh, keeping healthy and sustainable planet and the life on it. This uh, is also reflected by the total end of global greenhouse gas emission uh, by the single gas. CO2 from fossil fuels represents 68% of uh, these emissions, 7% of it comes from land use and forestry issues, CH4 18% and CO5% and that notwithstanding what we have been able to reach with the Kyoto Protocol. We're going to use for this meeting the state of the art of the simulation tools provided by an international and interdisciplinary team of scientists based again on the Institute of Technology but taking uh, uh, contributions from all the countries uh, that are nowadays actively involved uh, in uh, reflecting and acting against uh, these uh, terrible destiny that our planet is going to face if we don't act uh, uh, soon enough. This uh, is the baseline scenario that our scientific community has elaborated for us uh, and uh, by not taking any action we will find ourselves uh, by 2100 with an increase in temperature of 3.6 degrees Celsius or 6.5 Fahrenheit degrees. Uh, and what uh, does this mean? This is something that uh, should be useful also for the lay public and journalist. Uh, if uh, we just go over 3 or more than 3 degrees Celsius of warming, Arctic sea ice is gone in 2 out of every 3 summers. 50% of the insect species will lose uh, uh, more than 50% of their habitat range. We will suffer drought in a very uh, wide, very wide areas of the world for 11 months longer than the usual lands so of this kind of phenomenon. And uh, wildfires so in the Mediterranean area alone will double down. Uh, I, am, I haven't mentioned until now what kind of situation we will face if we uh, don't uh, uh, make uh, and don't make enough in order to stop climate change, also in terms of sea level rise. Uh, the meltdown of Arctic ice will create a situation like this, for example, in the city of Hanoi. And uh, this will mean uh, that uh, all the world is going to face a terrible crisis uh, connected and caused uh, by climate refugees that uh, are going to be uh, the next uh, uh, about the typical uh, form of refugees in our world, with all of the consequences entailed in this for uh, each country economy, <coughs> each country politically, stability, political stability, as well as the increased risk of war, just like uh, it has been dramatically shown uh, 
also by the famous action of Russia that today is not present here. It is a green card. This uh, is uh, what uh, is going to happen in the city of Dubai. This is Dubai, uh, for this uh, as it is today. This uh, is what Dubai will look like in uh, less than a hundred years, with just three degrees Celsius more of warming. It will be completely submerged by oil. Uh, we can uh, make an estimate in uh, uh, economical terms of uh, these uh, disasters, this set of disasters, it will, they will cost the world six hundred fifty billion dollars between. Uh, it has, they, they are costing six hundred fifty billion dollars between two thousand sixteen and two thousand eighteen, and uh, by the time we reach just half of the uh, possible world freezing temperature. This cool, this uh, uh, cipher, this number could get to fifty-four trillion dollars for all the global community. So our goals for today and for uh, Thursday are the following one. First, we should achieve the goal of limiting global warming to less than two degrees Celsius and uh, as close to 1.5 degrees Celsius as possible. Of course, uh, keeping into account and uh, taking into account the pre-industrial levels as a benchmark. Secondly, we have to agree on a deal to share the costs of mitigation, because this, uh, as uh, each one of you knows, uh, is uh, something that uh, has represented the worst obstacle to find a common and satisfactory agreement until now. This uh, is something, uh, as uh, all of the delegates uh, came, come, uh, the, who have come here today know very well, and uh, this is something that uh, we will uh, see, I hopefully uh, wish to see, uh, to hear this uh, today, especially from the delegates of the developed nations and the two most powerful of the former developing nations, the Republic of India and the People's Republic of China. In order to do this, uh, we, you are able to make a proposal to this summit <coughs> by uh, proposing a variation in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, by deciding a peak year by deciding a year when a reduction actually will begin and uh, setting a uh, uh, decreasing uh, rate for these emissions. You, you are also asked uh, by this summit and by the United Nations to take some decisions <laughs> about forestry and the land use uh, by manipulating two parameters. On one hand, uh, you can decide if and how much prevent deforestation in your country. And on the other hand, uh, you can, of course, if you want and if you think that you are capable of doing so, promote afforestation, again, in the territory of your country. And uh, finally, last but absolutely not least, uh, because uh, notwithstanding all the philosophical debates that we have had in the last uh, 20 years, we are still in the middle of an old system of production, of nominal production. We have talked about money. Because uh, we have a goal of spending a hundred billion dollars per year in order to uh, provide some aid to the most vulnerable countries. And uh, please, delegates, uh, I want to remind you that I'm talking about vulnerability of countries, not their wealth. All countries are vulnerable to these. And we have to decide, uh, as the United Nations, what to do in order to relieve the burden of disasters in order to provide affordable food and clean, drinkable water to all the countries that will be subject to these disasters. It's a common strategy and also a common strategy, economic strategy for dealing with immigration and refugees together with the reduction of emission. This uh, is uh, something uh, uh, that can be expressed uh, also in terms of these questions uh, that should guide your decisions about it. Is your country in need for funding? Uh, how much of this funding uh, each country wants to request? 
if you are a wealthy country or a wealthy block, uh, how much can you contribute to reaching that goal of 100 billion a year? And what are, most important, the terms and conditions for funding? We all know that here in this room uh, we have uh, at least three of the most important protagonists uh, of technological and scientific development in the world. But uh, it will be a lie to say that also the other blocks and the other countries that are represented here today are without the opportunity to promote uh, research and development in this field. Uh, at the end of uh, the speech, uh, that I am about to ask uh, at each uh, group uh, to deliver here in front uh, of the other delegates, I will uh, give you this uh, uh, these, uh, sheet to be, to, to be filled in order to summarize your national determined contribution on the three, on the several parameters that we have just highlighted. Uh, so, I want to <coughs> thank you for your attention and for being here. And I want to tell you one last uh, sentence uh, that is dedicated to you all. As I look around the room today, I see delegates who are younger than I am, and who, within your lifetime, and certainly within the lifetime of your children, will be faced with the consequences of your decisions today. I ask you for nothing less today than to feel the full weight of your decisions on your future and the future of the generation to come. What is the plan that you are going to leave for the future? Your task is straightforward in order to avoid all the dangerous climate change that we have just highlighted. We must achieve emission reductions that will stabilize the temperature increases below 2.0 degrees Celsius pre above pre-industrial levels and allocate at least, as I will say, 100 billion per year for climate financing for those who need it most. Say so this, I want to thank you again, and I am pleased to start from the COP28, the United Nations International Meeting on Climate Change. Thank you. Now, since the, uh, now since the meeting uh, is hosted in uh, Rome, one of the candles of the countries of the European Union, I ask you the delegates from the European Union to come here and to share their national government contribution to everybody, with everybody. Please, the delegates from the EU, come to the center of the EU.
as well as an efficient public transportation system, resulting in a significant reduction in carbon emissions from transportation. We also plan on implementing policies that incentivize the use of renewable energy sources like wind and solar power. For example, in one of our member nations, Germany, the government has introduced a feed-in tariff system that guarantees a fixed price for renewable energy producers for 20 years. This has led to a significant increase in the use of solar and wind energy, making Germany a leader in renewable energy production. We aim to implement this in all member nations. Finally, we will encourage energy efficient practices and technologies in households and businesses. Within Sweden, the government's Green Deal program helps households and businesses improve their energy efficiency by offering loans and grants for energy saving measures such as insulation and double glazing. Again, we hope to implement this across all member nations over the next 10 years. Um, in regards to our efforts to reduce defore deforestation and plant new forest area, um, we recognize that we have had issues with deforestation and believe some of our existing policies and actions to combat deforestation and promote sustainable forest management in developing countries have been inadequate and fragmented. We plan on addressing this issue through the EU Action Plan on Deforestation and Forest Degradation, which includes measures to reduce consumptions of products such as soy, palm oil, and beef, which are linked to deforestation and promote sustainable land use practices. We also want to support forest restoration and reforestation efforts in areas that have been cleared of forests. This can involve um, investing in forest landscape restoration projects, supporting agroforestry practices that combine crop production with tree planting, and promoting the use of native tree species and reforestation efforts. The forests of focus over the next 20, 10 to 20 years will be the um, Bialowiza Forest in Poland, which is one of the last remaining historical forests in Europe and has been subject to extensive log logging. Reforestation um, efforts there would focus on reestablishing natural forest structure and composition, as well as improving habitat connectivity. Mediterranean forests, such as the Cork Oak Forest in Portugal and Spain, um, the these forests have been impacted by overgrazing, fire, and land use change. Restoration efforts could focus on reducing grazing pressure and reintroducing native species such as oak trees that are adapted to the Mediterranean climate. Atlantic oak forests in France have been subject to extensive logging and fragmentation. Restoration efforts could focus on reestablishing natural forest structure and composition, as well as improving habitat connectivity. These issues will primar primarily be addressed by implementing stricter guidelines for forest management, particularly in areas that are prone to excessive logging. This will include setting limits on the amount of wood that can be harvested, the frequency of logging, and the types of trees that can be cut down. The guidelines will also require sustainable forest management practices, such as replanting trees and maintaining biodiversity. Additionally, we would like to promote sustainable alternatives to wood products, such as recycled materials or materials made from sustainable sources, like bamboo or hemp. This could, provide, this could include providing financial incentives for companies that use these sustainable materials and promote research and development of new sustainable materials. We also believe that it is important to involve local communities in forest restoration efforts, as they may have valuable knowledge and expertise regarding the restoration of local ecosystems. When it comes to how much the EU will contribute, if at all, to the Global Climate Fund, we will be happy to remain a, a contributor to the Global Climate Fund with a few conditions. It must be ensured that the funds are used effectively and efficiently, and that corruption and mismanagement are minimized. We'd also like to see more investment from other countries, which are larger polluters. In 2020, we pledged four billion dollars, four billion euros across our member states to the Green Climate Fund, which was the largest contribution to the fund in total. As CO2 emissions are higher in the U.S. and China, we want to see larger contributions from the United States and some contribution from China, which should be close to nothing in the previous years. If we continue to contribute to the fund, we would also like to see a larger pledge from all nations toward reducing their emissions. The United States has more than double the per capita emissions of the EU and only pledged to reduce their emissions by 26 to 28 percent, as opposed to a revised 10-year goal of 60 percent. If these conditions are met, we will remain contributors to the fund with a goal size of 100 billion and may consider raising our contribution to 5 billion. Along with our contribution, we will also be looking to promote private sector investment in developing countries to support renewable energy and sustainable development projects. Thank you.
get back, you will see it and summarize the national development contribution of the issue. Now, just following what happened in the preliminary uh, event for this summit uh, on uh, behalf of the United Nations Council and uh, uh, together <coughs> with uh, the uh, regional organizer of the summit, uh, I invite delegates of the People's Republic of China to join the seats and express their national development contribution. Thank you. Thank you. So, so. Thank you everyone for uh, attending the summit today. Uh, so first, uh, we as China are going to touch on our national action to reduce our fossil fuel emissions. Um, we do have a uh, pretty high reliance on fossil fuels, mostly coal, which accounts for over 50% of our energy use. And this, calls, uh, this has been seen to cause negative health impacts to our um, country. Uh, this is due to almost 10 billion tons of emitting, 10 billion tons of carbon dioxide per year being emitted from our country. However, we do realize that it is vital to reach an agreement um, that would reduce air pollution as well as reduce the possibility of political unrest within China. Um, our economy is grow growing rapidly and we are leveraging lots of business opportunities uh, for an energy transition away from fossil fuel. Um, right now, we are, we are one of the global leaders in renewable energy and we have invested a lot into, <coughs> into wind, solar, and hydropower projects. Uh, one of which notably is a smart grid that we project to power um, all of China within a couple of years. Um, we have increasing non-fossil fuel energy to account for over 20% of the primary energy consumption uh, by 2025. And our main goals are to have our peak CO2 emissions reach by 2030 and achieve net zero, net zero emissions by 2060. And lastly, these goals require doubling our electricity production uh, by 2060 from renewable and zero carbon energy. Reducing deforestation and land degradation is a critical global challenge, and China has a significant role to play in addressing this issue. Here's a plan of commitments that we will make to reduce deforestation and land degradation. One, develop a national plan for reducing deforestation and land degradation. The plan will include, tar include targets for reducing deforestation as well, as well as means to address the root cause of these issues, such as unsustainable agricultural practices, mining, and infrastructure development. To strengthen forest conservation and restoration efforts, we will invest in reforestation afforestation programs to prioritize conversation and conservation of existing forests. This should include establishment of protected areas, the enforcement of forest protection laws, and support for community-led forest conservation initiatives. Three, improve land use planning and management. We will ensure that the land use decisions are based on scientific assessments of ecological and social impacts and that land use plans are consistent with sustainable development goals. This could involve strengthening and using zoning, improving land use monitoring and enforcement, and promoting sustainable agriculture practices. And to continue more of our commitments about deforestation, um, Next, we want to increase support for sustainable agriculture. China will promote sustainable agricultural practices, including reducing the use of fertilizers and pesticides, promoting agroforestry, and supporting small holder farmers. Next, strengthening governance and enforcement mechanisms. China will strengthen governance mechanisms related to forestry and land use, including enhancing transparency, accountability, and stakeholder participation. China will also improve enforcement of laws related to all of this. And then next, promote international cooperation. China will actively engage in international efforts to address deforestation and land degradation, including through initiatives through the UN framework, as we are today, and the UN Convention of Biological Diversity and the Forest Stewardship Council. And then lastly, we want to increase public awareness and particip participation. We will improve public awareness of the importance of forests and the impacts of deforestation and land degradation. We will also encourage public participation in forest conservation and restoration efforts, including through the involvement of civil society organizations and local communities. And then by implementing these commitments, we will play a critical role in reducing deforestation and land degradation and promoting sustainable land use practices within our country. In regards to the uh, Global Climate Fund and how we will contribute and request, uh, China will face pressure to contribute to the Global Climate Fund since we are now the world's second largest economy. 
Any commitments we make should require some significant commitments to action by the U.S. and EU and other developed nations. The developed nations fear the rapid economic development we are now finally enjoying and may seek to use a global climate agreement to slow our growth, limit our markets, and constrain our diplomatic and military influence around the world. Meanwhile, the U.S. has pledged to reduce their emissions by only 26 to 28% by 2025 from 2005 levels, but several years of inaction by the Trump administration make success in fulfilling their pledge seem difficult. To provide some background on China's contribution to the fund, uh, China's uh, environmental fund assets grew to $47 billion in 2021 a 149% increase from the previous year sparked by record inflows and outperformance by the domestic clean energy sector, according to data from research firm Morningstar Incorporated. In the U.S., climate funds arose to $31 billion, while Europe, by far the biggest market, almost doubled to $325 billion. As for what China contributed, two new Chinese funds totaling U.S. $5 billion dollars to help developing countries tackle climate change and development problems could be a game changer in South-South cooperation and international relations. With such a large amount, the Chinese Climate Fund has the potential to facilitate many significant programs on climate mitigation, adaptation, and institutional building. As for the other fund announced by President Xi, the initial $2 billion is for South-South cooperation and for implementing the development agenda just adopted by the United Nations. The agenda centerpiece is the Sustainable Development Goals. President Xi mentioned poverty reduction, agriculture, health, and education as some of the areas the fund may cover. It is noted by many that the $3.1 billion Chinese climate aid exceeds the $3 billion that the United States has pledged, but not yet delivered to the Green Climate Fund under the UN Climate Convention. Now I will discuss our needs and requests. Quoting the International Finance Corporation's Regional Vice President for Asia and the Pacific, Ruth Horowitz, to reach net zero emissions by 2060, the report estimates China needs between 14 to 17 trillion US dollars in additional investments for green infrastructure and technology in the power and transport sectors alone. In order to achieve our climate goals and attain carbon neutrality by 2060, we require upwards of 17 trillion US dollars. Though this agenda would require the funds upfront to ensure our trajectory can sustain track, we will earmark our yearly funding at $400 billion for the Global Climate Fund to receive a total of 17 trillion dollars by 2063. I call for a break of just 10 minutes and then we are going to resume with the national liberty contribution of the United States of America. Thank you and see you soon. See you guys again. Thank you.